Is this sound long or short? Who said short? Is it long or short? Why is it long? Because it can occur in an open syllable. Those of you who still think this is short, you need to uh, correct that in your mind. Because in some of your notes, in the notes of some of you, it shows that some of you still think this is a short vowel. It is a long vowel. Everybody clear on that now? Is this long or short? Long. It's long. Once more, is this long or short? Long. Okay, don't forget. And the reason it came up is because <clears throat> uh, Mindy noted that in, one of, uh, in the notes of one of you, you said that awe is an example of, uh, okay, and I think I said it that way myself. That awe is an example of schwa following a short vowel. I think I did mention that myself that day, so I think that I better correct it. Awe is a, is a diphthong in American English. The sound after it is like ah almost, ah, ah. It's not because it's short, it's because it's the way it is, ah, ah. It is a pure vowel in British English. It's not short, but it has a diphthongal quality in American English. Okay, that's to clear up that. I think that's partly my fault, so I hope that's not clear. Basically what we're going to do today is we are going to try to make headway in chapter two. So let's go to page 37 and start. Everybody have your book open to page 37? Let's go. And I may ask you to stop in the middle of a paragraph. I do it anyway to explain, but I may ask you to do it and then I will continue summarizing in order to save time. Sometimes I'm no faster than having a student read. But I would like to get through the chapter as quickly as possible. So maybe I will have you read only part of the paragraph. I'll say thank you. And then I will summarize. Let's go on. Oh, let's start, actually. It is unfortunate that. All right, third word. How do we say that? <laughs> what kind of ending does it have? A-T-E. Everybody put this in your notes. If a word ends in A-T-E, what do you need to determine first? If it is a, a noun or an adjective as opposed to a verb. Everybody put this in your notes. It sounds like you're not really familiar with the rule. I know I've mentioned it before. If a word ends with A-T-E, first determine, is it a verb or is it a noun or adjective? Nouns and adjectives behave in the same way, so put those in the same category. So if it is a verb, we pronounce A-T-E, an A-T-E suffix as eight. For example, graduate. I know I've mentioned it because I've just reviewed the DVD where I said this in class. Now, I can't expect you to remember every single thing I say, but that shows why it's so important, number one, to take notes, number one, to pay attention, Number two, don't let your mind wander. That's hard, I know, I have that problem myself. Number two, to take good notes. And number three, to go over your notes carefully. That's why we have you organize and hand in your notes every week. Because otherwise, you might write something down, it sits in your notes. Usually we don't remember something like this the first two times it's mentioned. The third time, maybe you start remembering. That's the way it is with new vocabulary words as well. The first two times it doesn't sink in, Maybe the third time you remember it. A word that ends with A-T-E, what do you need to determine? Whether it is a verb or a noun or adjective. And what is this? It's an adjective. So if it, if, if it is a verb, if the word ending in A-T-E is a verb, we pronounce the ending as eight, as in graduate. If it is a noun or adjective, we pronounce it with a schwa, ut. Everybody, please remember this well, because this is a very simple rule. It's almost always right, not 100%, but almost always right. If we make mistakes or if we are irregular, it's usually in the direction of nouns pronounced as A-T-E, like candidate, I consider more standard, 
We can also say candidate. A lot of people do say candidate. I would prefer candidate. It follows the rule, okay? Continue, start over actually. It is unfortunate that different books on phonetics use different forms of phonetic transcription. All right, I'm gonna stop you right here because this paragraph is quite long and sort of wordy and I've already told you the content, is that right? You will find different transcription systems. We're sticking with standard, worldwide agreed upon IPA. There are other systems that are used for TESOL books and in phonology and in other places. That, for example, like to use a single letter for CH. And I said this in a previous class. It's a C, the letter C with a hot check on it. And you can see it in the text. They give you examples of S with a hot check is pronounced what? Go to the middle of the paragraph. Sh, right. And Z with a hot check is pronounced Z. C with a hot check is pronounced Ch. And we've got one more. J with a hot check is pronounced J. So that's all about all you need to know from this paragraph. I've already told you in a previous class that we use T and ESH for CH. The reason is because they are phonetically two separate sounds. Phonologically, how many phonemes? How many inwe are T and ESH? I'll put it on the board so we're sure that we're talking about the same thing. T and SH. That's how many phonetic sounds? It's two, and it's an African, which is a se ta in. It's a se yin plus a ta yin, so it's two sounds phonetically. But phonemically, how many sounds is it? How many phonemes is it? That means, can we separate these two sounds in a word like church? Like t, sh, er, t, ch. We can't do that because ch is one single inseparable phoneme. It's two sounds phonetically, but it's only one phoneme. We can't separate it and still make sense. We can go ch, er, ch, but we can't go t, sh. We just can't do that because it's an inseparable phoneme. So in phonetics, we like to use the double symbols. It reminds you that those really are two different sounds produced in two different ways. But when we're talking about phonology, it makes good sense to use a single symbol because we can't really separate it in speech. Everybody clear on that? And so his point here is saying that uh, different books will use different systems. A lot of books don't use IPA. They will use, for example, Y for the Y sound. What symbol do we use for the Y sound in IPA? J. Why do we not like somebody using Y for the J sound? Because we need the Y symbol for the U sound. And we don't need U for English. And that's why phonologists and TESOL books can use it. But here we are in Taiwan. Do we need that Y for our purposes? We need it for Mandarin, right? We need it for Mandarin. We don't need it for Minayu. Minayu has no U. Mandarin does. So we need to keep our symbols unambiguous and consistent. Other books can do it if they're only talking about English and they've got other purposes in mind like phonology or TESOL. Okay? So that's all this paragraph is saying. Uh, he's saying that there is an example which will show that TESH is really two sounds. This is towards the bottom of the paragraph. If you say why choose, what's the beginning of choose? Ch, right. But we could also divide it up across words. We can't divide it up in the same word, but across words we can. We can say white shoes. If I put a big pause there, you won't get the point. But if I say it fast, white shoes, white shoes. Did you hear a ch in there? White shoes, white shoes, white shoes. The T and the ash will go together quickly and then we will hear the ch. So he's using that as an illustration or as a way of showing you that ch is really two sounds, white shoes, white shoes, white shoes. Everybody got it? Got the point? If you don't, please raise your hand and we'll go over it again. 
Um, okay, but what is the difference between why choose and why choose? Why choose, why choose, they both have a ch sound in them. They have the same symbols and the same sequence. What's the difference? One simple word. Ruby? We stopped at the stop. We also stop at the stop in ch, but it's very, very short. So the one word I'm after is timing. The timing is different. We have a longer pause after the T in white than we do after the T in choose. There's still a T there and we still stop, but we stop very, very, uh, a very, very short time. So white shoes, a longer stop. White shoes, to home and yoga stop, but it's so fast we can barely catch it. Annie, is it okay? Yeah. So that's the point of this paragraph. You are responsible for reading this on your own. We're going to the next page. Some other books on phonetics transcribe ch and j as in church and judge with single symbols. We've already talked about that. Um, we'll see that some linguistic segments have two phonetic elements, for example, vowel diphthongs. Linguistic segments, that's what we can call a diphthong. Somebody asked me, is a diphthong one sound or two? Well, it depends on how you define it. It's, define it. it's two vowels put together in the same syllable. But we can call that a segment. I, we can call that a segment. They have two elements. Element, like and e. And then segment, like just a diphthong. And so, for a diphthong, it's good to use two symbols. He's already explained why he likes to use t and esh for the ch sound. Phonetically, they're two sounds. And also, for diphthongs, it's good to use two symbols. In English spelling, we usually have, for many diphthongs, we have two symbols, but they are not continuous. For example, Here, this A stands for the A sound, which we write like this. But it's not just the A that tells us that. In spelling and phonics, it's the silent E at the end. Without that, let's use a better example. Let's use rat, because this forms a word, and rate. In both cases, this A, it, in each case, the A stands for a different thing. But in this case, we know that it's A because of the E at the end. So this is A, and this one is A. Is that right? OK. So that's just talking about spelling. In spelling, we often, in fact, do use two letters to represent a diphthong. Or, for example, pale. Here we're using AI. In spelling, we actually do usually use two symbols. In some phonetic symbol systems, they don't. For example, a very famous one in Taiwan, they only use one symbol for the A sound. Which system is that? KK, right. We've already covered this. They use this for A. They use this for O. And I've told you we're changing to this and this for O. So Latifoget is just going over the reasons why it's good to use two symbols for affricates and why it's good to use two symbols for diphthongs. In Taiwan, it's especially important, as I've mentioned earlier. It's because the second element of the diphthong in Taiwan is often dropped. You monophthongize diphthongs. Taiwan So instead of saying take, in Taiwan, you often hear tack. Yeah. For example, tack that pen, tack. We often hear tack or tack for take. I think it's partly because in KK you use only one symbol. We said this in a previous class. So Peter Latifoget is now, and also Professor Johnson, they're just going over these points. It's better to use the phonetic way of writing it for our purposes in this class. OK? So both for affricates and for what? Diphthongs, diphthongs. Not diphthongs, everyone. Diphthongs. Mm-hmm. All right. 
The glottal stop, he's talking about glottal stop that begins words are, that are spelled with an initial vowel. We've talked a bit about glottal stops. We're in the middle of the second paragraph on page 38. Hosein is usually the first sound we hear of a word that starts with a vowel, especially when it's the first word in an utterance. So for example, is he coming? I, I, I. The first sound is not, uh, it's not a vowel, it is a glottal stop. Is he coming? Is he coming? And he mentions this in the middle of the second paragraph. Um, is written phonetically with, we already know this, <clears throat> we don't use the, 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 uh, the slashes. We're going to use this because it's not a phoneme. <clears throat> it's not an independent phoneme. It's a phonetic realization. It's, it's, or a phone. It's a phonetic realization of, uh, of a pronunciation. Okay? So we can use this symbol at the beginning of words that start with vowels. We usually don't put it in because it's understood, because it's a rule. Almost every word that starts with a vowel, especially if it's the first word in an utterance, the first sound is actually a glottal stop. Because it's a rule, we don't have to keep marking it because it's redundant. If we are being careful and we're trying to produce a more narrow transcription, we may put that in. So in the middle of the paragraph, it says that the word flee east, Wang Dong Tao Zhou. It's pronounced flee east. Flee east. First of all, it's how many syllables? two syllables, and second, it's got that glottal stop in between. We don't usually say flee east. We can. We can say flee east. We can say flee east. I'm trying to take out the glide. The glide. Or usually we will put in a glottal stop. Flee east. Everyone? Flee east. Flee east. Let's try to do it without the glottal stop, but still with two syllables. Flee east. Flee east. We can do that, and we do it often. But usually we'll put a glottal stop in there to separate the two syllables, the two words. Flee east. Flee east. All right. How is that different from F L E E C E D? Fleeced means ba ta shen shang de mao qu diao. Fleeced ha you yi ge li yu de yi si. It means pian zou ren jia de qian cai. He fleeced him. He fleeced him. Ta jiu pian zou ta suo you de qian cai. To flee somebody. This is li yu. So, flee east is one pronunciation, and if it's F L E E C E D, it's fleeced. Fleeced. Everyone? Fleeced. 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 So, then he says the status of a glottal stop as, or the glottal stop as a consonant phoneme in English is questionable because its distribution is limited. We often look for, well, when we are talking about phonemes, we are doing phonology. <laughs> And if it sometimes turns up, but not very often, it就是很少出现，而且好像是很特别的情况情况之下才会出现。我们就很怀疑这是不是真正的一个phoneme，是不是真正的一个音位？它可能只是一个表面的一个phonetic的一个呈现，它可能只是因为某一种某一些情况会
For this one, there's a joke. It's a really famous phonetics joke. And you should know about it. You can try it on your friends. But you have to know two vocabulary words first. First, in Native American culture, there's another kind. That's called a wigwam. Now, this sounds like really ty hua, but you need to know these two words to understand the joke. There's a guy who's having terrible problems sleeping well. He just can't sleep well. So he goes to a doctor, and he says, Doctor, you know, I'm having so much trouble sleeping because one night I dream I'm a teepee. Do you understand? And then he says, and then the next night I dream I'm a wigwam. I keep dreaming that I'm a teepee and I'm a wigwam. And the doctor says, well, you know what your problem is? You're too tense. <laughs> you laughed. You got it. Isn't that good? And that joke is based on this phenomenon that tense actually sounds like tense, right? So there's maybe your first phonetics joke. <laughs> this is a really famous one, and it's a good one that illustrates it. The reason we have that T sound, we will run into it later in the text. This is called an epenthetic consonant. Epenthetic. And I think I've mentioned it before. And it's because if we have a nasal and then a voiceless fricative after it, so, N is nasal, and S is a wusheng de yiga ta yin. Na ho na, ta jo hui mao tu yiga gen n tong wei, tong yiga fa yin ji, nigga wei ji da. Yes, tong yang shi alveolar de yiga se yin, yiga wusheng se yin. So, siga gui ze, this happens. Another place that happens that will help you with your pronunciation, and that is with the word strength. Strength. Now, a lot of Taiwanese say strength. And in fact, a lot of native speakers do too. I've been paying attention for years. A lot of native speakers pronounce this strength. But I don't, because that's an NG. As far as I'm concerned, it really should be velar. So strength to me sounds weird, but I hear it. For me, the standard way is string, voiceless fricative. So what kind of a stop are we going to get in this word? What kind of an epenthetic stop are we going to get? There we go. You got it. K, right? So listen to the way I say this normally. And I'm not doing this on purpose. It's just the way I say it. Strength. Can you all hear the K? Yeah. Strength. Strength. Once more. Everybody, strength. Very good. Now, in this case, we have a T. In this case, we have a K. Are those phonemes? No, phonetic and that's what he's saying here is probably the case with glottal stops. Not just a biao mian, not just a genju yu jing, hui, chu xian de, yi ge e wai de yin, er bu shi yi ge du li de, bu shi shu yi wo mi de yu yin xi tong. Ah hou mei you zui xiao dui bi de li zi. For example, is and is. Those are not two different words. Just two ways of saying the same thing. Strength and strength. Mei you ke, shen zi strength, zi san ge dou yi yang. OK, so we're talking here about phonemes. We want to figure out what the phonemes of English are. And he's saying that we've got a glottal stop that we use a lot in English. The two main purposes are is a glottal stop, usually, at the beginning of an utterance, especially. 
And it often replaces a T in what situation? I said in another class. If it's the last sound of a syllable and the next syllable starts with a? 这个音节最后一个音是T,下一个音节,第一个音是个子音,那个T要怎么念? I, I just went over the DVD, we spent a lot of time on it in class, so it's in your notes, I'm sure. It's a glottal step, thank you, very good. Maybe you're just being shy, quiet. So remember our example was hit me. Hit me. We can say it with a T, but we often say hit me. Hit. 后面那个T会变色差,也不会变成一个喉色音. So those are two common purposes for the glottal stop in English. Neither of them is phonemic. 这两个都不是phoneme,都是allophone,都是一个表面现象,就是某一个语境,它有某一个变化,有某一个音会出现。它不是一个属于我们的基本的那个set of phonemes. Everybody's got that? The set of phonemes are the set of symbols that will make a difference if we insert them into a word, like pat, bat, P and B, 绝对是不同的phoneme. But eat and eat, those are not different phonemes. So glottal stop phoneme, 应该不是一个phoneme. All clear? 这里就是讲 glottal stop, the phonemic status, 它不是一个phoneme,而且为什么? So we say flee east to make it clear. We separate the words. It's got two syllables. We put that glottal stop in there to keep them separate. If we made, took the glottal stop out, it would be flee east. It'd still have the same meaning. Flee east is only one syllable, and that's entirely different. Where other consonants may appear in a variety of positions and words, for example, note the K in cat, scab, back, active, across. Glottal stop only occurs Word initially before vowels in American English. So it's the only go. Diga in su mu in the shaho. That's how we have glottal stop. So across down su. In Cockney. Cockney is a worker class speech of the East End of London. It also appears between vowels in words like butter and button. So butter, I have what in my kind of English? I have a tap, butter, butter. For button, I don't have a tap. What do I have? I have a glottal stop, but usually it's an unreleased T plus a glottal stop. Button. Mayo T yakai. Let's talk about butter, because that's different from the way I do it. In cock in cockney, it would be but uh. But uh. Everybody try but uh. All right, ping I say I use a tap. I say bottle. But how would a Cockney speaker say bottle? Bottle. Bottle. 对,这是Cockney的一个特色. This is important to know. Cockney, in fact, is becoming an endangered speech variety. 现在真的讲Cockney的人,真正的Cockney越来越少. I have put an example of it on the web page, on one of the web pages. Maybe I'll dig it out during break. He is an author. He's a genuine native speaker of Cockney, and you'll hear it spoken very naturally. Usually when you hear sp uh, Cockney spoken now, it's a parody of Cockney. So a lot of people don't really speak it natively anymore. However, the glottal stop is used a lot in many dialects, especially in British English. Because it is associated with Cockney, do you think that Cockney is admired as a prestige variety of British English? No, it is not. It's a less prestigious kind of variety. And so, for that reason, Brits are very sensitive to glottal stops. Glottal stops are kind of looked down on. Even though Brits use glottal stops a lot in certain places, they don't notice those. But they will notice it if you say butter instead of butter. And they will immediately have a prejudice against you. He will, they will judge you. And I'm sorry, you can't help it. I had this discussion with my British friend just not long ago. And I was talking about, remember I told you to avoid saying X, right? Ask me a question. What's the reason? Well, first of all, it's not standard. That's the simplest reason. But also, what do we associate it with? Southern and black English, and they're not prestige varieties of English, and they will distract your listener. 
And I was talking with my friend about, we can't help it. We have got this race thing. It still has not been solved. When we see somebody, we can't forget their color immediately. It's just the way it is. I think Chinese are the same. And then he says, well, you know, that depends on the individual. I said, no, I think it's everybody. I said, okay, well, how about you? If you meet somebody who talks like, uh, says, ba uh, and then he uh, is very working class, not sophisticated, he said, oh, yes, well, that's our problem, our, we Brits. He <laughs> down working class, even now in Britain, it's the same as race in America. Race is an issue there too, but what social class you belong to is really, really a big thing in Britain. And then you will hear a story, I think it's by George Bernard Shaw. He says that all you have to do, oh yeah, it's from Yao Tiao Shu Nui. It's from Pygmalion, his original. He says all a British person has to do is open his mouth to make another British person hate him. It's Han Yen Zong, I'm not kidding you. As soon as they hear that ba uh, you don't count, they're not going to be friends with you probably because they're not good enough for you. Now, I'm saying it really extreme. Things are changing now because glottal stops are becoming more and more common in varieties of British English. But I'm just telling you that these are social linguistic phenomena and they are gut reactions. We can't help it. We can't help it. You can use your conscious brain to say, I'm going to overcome that prejudice and forget about it or try to ignore it. You can do that, but it's still there. And for Brits, this thing is a big thing. So that's why glottal stop is an issue. Not such an issue in American. Although it is a small one, because if I heard people say a airplane or the other, the other, and I, it's, to me it sounded uneducated. I said in a previous class. We should say, in, at least in my opinion, not the other, but the other, the other. That to me is more standard and it's more prestigious. The other, it was, also, it was already common when I was a kid and I kind of was a bit judgmental about it. So, but uh, so it's a very All right, but keep in mind. And then he's got other examples here. He says that the glottal stop also uh, is used with the final T in words like cat and bat. They can be glottalized. Replaced by the glottal stop or the glottal stop comes at before it or after it at the same time. It can be in any of those places. So if your voice goes down to a creek. Remember we talked about a creek being as low as you can go, you can count the pulses. Uh, remember the creaky voice that we used to find what? Which formant? First formant, that's right. So if we go way down to the creek, then we're getting, when we stop to just one creek, that's a glottal stop. And when we have a final stop in words, so here it gives you examples like cat and bat. We often have a glottal stop there because we're going down to a creek. So, bat, bat, home in creaky. And when I stop at the creek, it becomes a glottal stop. So, bat, I still have a T, but I may have a glottal stop together with a T. That's what they're talking about here. So, look at the end of paragraph two, page 38. You need to mark that. That will be in a test. Okay? So, this is a glottalized final stop in a syllable. So cat, cat, cat. I've already gone down to the creek, so there's a glottal stop. Cat, cat. I still have a T. I would not drop that T. But there, it may be glottalized. So pronounced with simultaneous. It can be a little earlier, a little later, at the same time. Let's just say it's most often simultaneous. Cat. Glottal stop, jia zhang, final stop. Okay? Okay, ma? So these are different functions of the glottal stop. Is any of them phonemic? Is there any difference between, listen carefully, is there any difference between cat and cat? Cat, cat. Is there any difference? No. The second one, I got creaky and had a glottal stop. The first one, I did not. So is the glottal stop a phoneme? If it doesn't make a difference in meaning, it's not a phoneme. That's your test. If it makes a difference in meaning, if it becomes a new word with a different meaning, then it's a different phoneme. But if it's just a variation of the same word, it is not a phoneme. 清楚吗? 
We need to know this in order to judge whether a sound is a phoneme or not. And that is relevant in just about, in the analysis of just about any languages because I've talked to you before about an and yin. Why do we write e an? Meaning is yin. Why don't we write uh, e and then e and then un? Why don't we do that? In fact, the is a tongue phoneme. Well, actually, it's two phonemes. We write them as one. But this is the same as 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 the same the same as 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 the is anybody not with me? Please ask questions if you want to clarify anything, because I've just related what we're doing in English to what happens in one situation in Chinese. Anybody want to ask anything? Ting Chu Ma, give me some feedback that shows it's clear. OK. Look up, smile, say, mm, I got it. All right. So I'm assuming now that you understand um, that you understand everything in this paragraph. There's just one more thing. Towards the beginning of the paragraph, I didn't say that there's something called a ligature. Go to about the eighth or ninth line. If you want to make it clear, if you're using a phonetic style of transcription, and you want to make it clear that this is the same phoneme, this is a phoneme, has a liang phoneme. It's like a ch, it's a phoneme, has a liang phoneme. It's just one. Ch comes together. An affricate, it's an affricate, it's only one phoneme. If we want to make it clear that this actually is only one sound, one phoneme, you can use something called a ligature. Ligature means to bind. If you really, really want to make it clear, Phonetically, That's towards the beginning of the paragraph. That's called a ligature. Ligature, L-I-G-A-T-U-R-E, ligature. And we're going to use this ligature in other places, so this is worth knowing. I think we've covered the main points. Let's go on. There's one more minor matter still to be considered in the transcription of consonant, uh, consonant contrasts of English. In most forms of both British and American, which does not contrast with which, especially in standard British English, RP, the hu sound is totally gone. Now, a lot of you think that more conservative pronunciations are per perhaps British English. Is that right? Maybe some of you have this idea. Is that right? Have you had this idea? Yeah. OK. Thank you, Stanley. <laughs> um, but in this case, not, because the hu sound, like in which, W-H-I-C-H, is absolutely, totally gone from standard British. 就是标准是的RP,那种音是完全没有或都现在都是我,这我可以确定. And I've discussed this with my British English teacher as well, and I've seen it reported many times. 所以最标准的音是那个或, if you hear it, that's a In way, Ibaran, native speakers, American is different. I push you to get rid of the hua and exchange it for wu because that's the way I speak. And that's the way, in my impression, the mainstream speaks. Most American speak speakers use the wu sound instead of which. They'll say which for both. However, as I've mentioned in another class, I now have noticed over the past 10 or 15 years, many regions of America still have the hu sound. And many people, many individuals have it. And I have one good linguist friend who is saying, which one is it? She's from Iowa. I said, why do you use hu? She said, I think it's fun. <laughs> she changed her whole speech style just for fun. She's a linguist, incredible ear speaks many languages fluently, Japanese, Chinese, among others. 
And she now says, which one for fun? And it's totally natural. OK, so in American English, who is more common, but I encourage you to stick with who. It's gone from RP. It's the mainstream of American. And there are different ways of writing it. In KK, you represent it with HW. Is that right? And we used to use that in Old English as well. That's probably where we got the inspiration. But later on, with spelling changes, the sound came to be written as WH. It got switched around. Fine yang. What is the first word? What? That means listen. Listen, I'm going to tell you a story. What? And that's how it's written. Besides this way of writing it, we can write it HW, as in KK. We can also write it with an upside down W. This is not an M. This is the We can use this upside down W for the same sound. That's an IPA symbol, a recognized IPA symbol. And there is a further way of doing it if you really want to. Because this is a voiced or voiceless sound. It's voiced. If we want to make it voiceless, that means pronounce this as a voiceless sound. So in theory, in actual practice, we have three ways of writing huo. And actually, I don't need any of them, <laughs> right? Because I don't use them. My third grade teacher tried to train us to say which, where, what. And we just thought it was funny. Okay, because none of us spoke like that anymore. But these are three different ways of writing the same thing. We've covered um, 38. All right, so, can you read the first paragraph? We have a new section, the transcription of vowels. We've already talked about consonants. Let's, let's just go look through the table, see if everything is familiar. Those of you who didn't know P, uh, KK before, let's go through the table on page 36, table 2.1. Page 36, 2.1, look at the list of symbols on the left. Uh, I'll just read them, you repeat. For those of you who don't know the symbols really well yet, this should help you. The rest of you, maybe it will, Josh and Insha. So, everybody, P, Pi, T, Tai, K, Kai, B, Bai. Notice my voice gets lower when I voice. Remember that, because in the future when we discuss Chinese tones, we're going to refer to that. This is going to be useful in the future when we discuss Chinese. See how many of you remember it when we refer to it. Rang. Can't put it at the beginning. Phi. V. Vi. Phi. Okay, note theta for those of you who didn't know KK. Theta is it's voiceless. V. Vi. This is the same sound but voiced. And this letter was also used in Old English and Middle English. This is the same sound but voiced. Z, Zai. Never mind. Zion. Zion. Mm -hmm. Next. Sh. And the para uh, what they have in parentheses is the other style, the phonological style. S. Hachek. Remember Hachek. Shy. Genre. Okay. They don't have it there because they want a, wants a single syllable here. Ooh. Lie. Lie. W. w. Why. Lie. I don't say why, but it's possible. Everybody, why. why? And those are the three ways to write it if you want to say it that way. But this one again is w. w. Why. why. R. 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 Rye. Rye. Y. Yeah. Ye. Ye. This is hard for Taiwan students because e and ye, 
Mark that. I may test you on that sometime. 还有另外两对，一个是 e 字母 e， 跟 ye 是你们的意思。另外一对是 east east 东东边和酵母。Everybody east. east. Not east. It's not east. It's east. east. Please don't make the mistake. It's really common. E e e east. east. Okay. 下一个字一样，可是前面加一个滑音音 yeast. Uh huh. And the other one is ear. 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 Glottal stop. Ear. 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 So put those three minimal pairs down. We contrast e and ye. In Chinese, they are not different phonemes. They are allophones. In Guo, Ying Guo, it's the same thing. In Guo, Ying Guo, Ying Wen. They're the same. But e, ye are different. East, yeast are different. And ear, ear are totally different. So ye definitely is a phoneme. It is not in Chinese at the beginning of a an e sound. And then we have h.、Huh. Actually, it's voiceless. Hi.、Mm -hmm. And all this is is aspiration. Remember that for a test. Some tables do not have、huh. because because. It doesn't have any special place of articulation. 提前讲，那个 h 的发音的位置完全看后面的母音在哪里，那个 h 就搬到哪里去了。So he h will be very high in front. Ha, what will it be? Low in back. He and ha 那个 h 就是跟随着那个母音来定位。And that's why you won't even find an h on some phonetic symbol tables. So once more, hi. And then we have. It says note the following because they're composite. They're two phonetic sounds put together to form a single phoneme. Ch, ch, hi. That is now a word that's common in English, right? In Taiwan as well. Chai, Indian chai. You'll hear chai tea. Chai 就是茶，是从中文来的。可是是印度式的茶，是加的那个炼乳的，然后加了一些香料。That's chai. So we can add that word here. It is now a common word. Everybody, ch. No, I'm still on ch. Ch. Chai. And j. Jai. The word they give is jive. Jive. All right. For those of you who Didn't know a, uh, uh, KK before. Make sure that you learn these well. Now, what they have here in the different columns. First of all, we already went through the first column with I. Second column, same thing with E. We don't need to repeat it. Just gave us a couple extra example words like Z and V. Well, we had Vi, but Z. We didn't have a word Zi. And then, in the third column. Some words can only appear at the end or middle of a word. So, like ng, for contrast, we have everybody ram, ram. ran, ran. rang, ran. and I know a lot of you will have trouble with this. So we're going to come back to it some other time. And then for it's there for contrast. Listen, mizen. mizen. All right, mizen is an unusual word. Look it up yourself. It's unusual. We don't use this word often. Mission, mission, mission like a mission to Africa, 传教 vision. vision, okay. So s, z, sh, z. Then we have the last column. What is that? It's names for the symbols because when we're talking, we're not writing. We can't see them. We need a way to refer to them. So if it's 小写的什么字母 we just say lowercase p for example. Everyone, lowercase p. Lowercase p. Lowercase m. Lowercase m. Now for ng, I often just say ng to make it clear. It can be called ng or angma. Engma. I've also seen it called angma. So everyone, ng, Eng. angma. Engma. So from now on, if I say angma, that means ng 这个音 And then we have. Theta, because that's from Greek. In modern Greek, I understand it's theta, but we say theta, the classical Greek. Want everybody theta? theta. And then the voiced version, ev, ev. Now over the phone, that would not be clear. It might sound like s or something. It wouldn't be clear, or s. I don't know. Then we have for the elongated sh sound, the elongated s that represents the sh sound. We call it esh. 
Sometimes we say a long S, just as really good, a lot of tongue tongue, they get S. Everybody, esh. Or we can say a long Z for Z. That's one way to say it. Everybody, long Z. Long Z. It's often also called yoke. Yoke. Yeah. And that's for Z. That takes care of the names of the symbols. That got us through to vowels. The bell has rung. Okay, it will still be your turn to read. We'll try to get through. We'll try and try, try hard to finish the chapter, second hour. We're going to try to uh, go faster. All right, take your break. Before we continue, everybody ready? Before we continue talking about vowels, first of all, did anybody look up mizzen? I found a picture of it online. It's the third mast of a ship. Now, we don't usually sail ships now. We don't have a bunch of masts and sails anymore, so it's not used anymore unless you read old novels. A mizzen, it's the third mast of a ship. All right, um, talking about phonemes, I think the clearest thing we've said was the day when we said that the phoneme is you and the allophones are the way you behave in different circumstances with different people, right? So the sound uh, as a phoneme, that is just the guanian, just the abstract concept of the sound. But the actual pronunciation in different situations are different allophones, but they all come back to the same sound if they are the same phoneme. This becomes a little problematic when you're working with Chinese because, first of all, <clears throat> as I tried to say in another class, we are very deeply influenced by our writing system. What we believe about our language is very, we have very, very deep convictions that are based on the writing system. And sometimes they're useful and correct and sometimes not. Some not so correct ones that are misleading in English. The average English speaker believes that NG is two different phonemes. How many is it? Okay, I believe that the average English person who doesn't, or English speaker, wouldn't call them phonemes, but he believes those are two separate sounds. Because we talk about dropped ends. If we say, for example, going instead of going. We say that's a dropped G, not dropped N, sorry, dropped G. Now, the standard way to say it is going, but in casual speech, we say going. We call that a dropped G. Did we really drop a G? Did we take away a sound to make going into going? Did we take away a sound? No, we just what? We exchanged sounds. We replaced ing with N, mm, right? N, mm, instead of N, mm, we have N, mm, go in. But native speakers will assume that we have taken off a sound because we have taken off a letter. That's an example of how the writing system confuses us. And you should know that NG was not originally a phoneme in English. Those were two separate sounds. So just like in finger, we write NG, but we've got an N mm and a ger. And actually, it's un, not un. So originally, and we would say singer, but then eventually the g got dropped in many situations. So originally, we did not have the phoneme ng, and that explains why its distribution is so limited. If it were, now we only find un where? At the end of a syllable. Okay, now you understand why. Because originally it was not a phoneme at all. Okay? That's one place where we mix up the, the, where the writing system affects the way we think about the language and it's not correct. How about th? How many sounds in th? How many phonemes? How many phonemes in th? One. You all know that. You know that better than native speakers because most of you have had KK training. But native speakers will usually think of this as two different sounds, they, that they're two, two sounds simply because they're two letters. That's an example of how the writing system really sort of sets in cement the way we think about language. Now, you do the same thing with doing fu hao. And I just had a little discussion with Alex, which I think was, was uh, we'll throw some light on it. I almost called this a phoneme, but it's not a phoneme, it's two sounds. If you look over here, it's a, n, an, 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 
We've got a vowel and a nasal. Those are 绝对的是两个音. But when you look at this, don't you think of it as one sound? Ruby? Yeah, of course you do, because it's just like this in English. All right, we think of th as two sounds, because it's written as two. You think of two sounds as one sound, because it's written as one sound. That's totally normal. Doesn't mean it's correct, but it's to be expected. But you need to change these ideas now because now you are phoneticians and you know better. So this is an, two sounds, not a phoneme, it's two phonemes. When we put e in front of it, as we mentioned in class before, e is what kind of vowel? Where is it? High front. So it's going to pull the vowel in an up higher too. So it becomes from an, we get yin, from a to e. When we have a velar nasal after it, where do we pronounce a velar nasal? What part of our vocal tract? What part of our vocal tract do we pronounce a velar nasal? Ung, where? Front? Back. High or low? Well, it's coming together, right? So this is very back. And because it's back, we now have an a instead of an a or an e. So we have an, yin, ang, and yang. We've got two things here that could influence the pronunciation of the vowel. We've got y. When we had y in this case, what did it do to the vowel? It raised it, right? Made it higher. So from an, we got yin. Now we have ang because the ng the sound, the angma sound, pulled it back. But what if we put both of them around that vowel? Which one influences it more? The nasal or the glide? In this case, you can see it's the nasal. We say yang. We don't say yang. We don't say yang, just like we say yin, but we don't say yang. <coughs> so, both what comes before the vowel and what comes after the vowel can influence the vowel. But in this case, ng angma is 比较厉害. 因为那个y,你再怎么放个y,它还是ang, yang. Right? Now, are these all the same phoneme? We have a, a, we have e, we have a. Are they the same phoneme? You're not so sure because, look, you've got, first of all, you didn't even think that this was two sounds, and same for this one, two sounds. And in addition, <clears throat> in addition, we've got a totally different symbol here. This is because it's a velar nasal, but the vowel is not represented separately. Is that right? Give me feedback, guys. Otherwise, I'm going to keep looking at you and asking. <laughs> okay. So, we've got different symbols here, but let's not, we know that the Nasals are different phonemes. Un, gen ang, and the next one is un, Those are different phonemes. Although in Taishi, the Mandarin, there are some phonemes that are different phonemes. But they are different phonemes. But what about the vowel? Is, are the vowels different phonemes? Use your brain. Think hard. Look at this pattern here that we've got. Very good. Go ahead. You think they're not because <clears throat> they're just allophones of the same vowel. So here is a really clear example. And by the way, I've started using IPA for Chinese. So write these down. This will give you a help when we start transcribing Mandarin into IPA. Here's a here's an introduction. For un, we are going to use this with mouth's the a. For 前面有一这个有一这个 They're all the same phoneme and that's why I'm using brackets. 我用斜线的话,我可能全部都用一种形式的A。因为都是同一个phoneme, we are quite sure of that. So you're going to have to start looking at Chinese through the lens of the IPA and through the lens of phonetics and you will See it more clearly, because what you know now about the sounds of Mandarin is mostly due to what? Mostly based on the 
，你们对国语的音的了解主要是根据什么？注音符号 ，which we call in English the Mandarin phonetic symbols. If you want an English name, the Mandarin phonetic symbols, otherwise known as bupamufa. <laughs> okay, the Mandarin phonetic symbols. So everybody understands what's going on here. Same vowel, an alveolar nasal gives us a more front vowel. An alveolar nasal plus a glide at the beginning, the y, a palatal glide, makes it higher. So ab goes to e. A velar nasal at the end makes the vowel very back, and then it becomes a. Ah. And then even if we put a palatal glide here, it doesn't change the vowel if there's a velar nasal after it. Everybody followed that? This is really important for you because that's going to help you sort out Chinese much faster if you understand it. Zhuin Fu Hao is kind of curious. So oh, I wrote this here. So Alex was saying, "Are you sure an isn't just one phoneme? Is everybody convinced now that an has two phonemes?" 都相信吗 What is Zhuyin Fu Hao? How 我们怎么样做分类 This is an alphabet, 字母 and an example is A B C D E. That's an alphabet, and we put sounds together. Not quite phonemic, but it's something like phonemes. So m, a, n, man, it's three letters, three phonemes. So sometimes it works pretty well. For Japanese, we have kaki kuke ko. That's not an alphabet. We call that a syllabary. Everyone, syllabary. These words are important, and they will also turn up in tests. Make sure you understand them and you know the words. That's called a syllabary because we have a consonant plus a vowel. That's a syllable. It's a C V structure, so structured syllable. Consonant plus vowel. 大写的 C 是 consonant. 大写的 V 是 vowel， so consonant vowel 这种结构的 syllable， kaki kuke ko， etc. That's a syllabary. So these two 类型还蛮清楚。But what is Zhuyin Fu Hao? Is it a an alphabet? Is it a syllabary? What is it? Yeah, but what about b, b, e, b? Two phonemes, two symbols. Isn't it behaving like an alphabet? Man, m, a, n, man. Oh, an is not a good. Sorry, bad example. <laughs> okay, if you if we take like single vowels, we have no problem. Ma, ma, da, ma, ma, m, a, ma. Two symbols, two phonemes, right? So in those cases, it behaves like an alphabet. But as soon as we get to An an ang ang. It starts behaving like a syllabary. So what are we going to call Zhuyin Fu Hao? A mixture. 综合的，它是两种性质综合在一起。So it is a mixed system. It's part alphabet, part syllabary. All of these words and and when do you have a question? What would you classify them as? Syllabary or alphabet? Anybody who knows a little bit about Korean, Korean is widely praised as one of the really great writing systems of the world. It's a really good writing system. It was carefully designed to suit the needs of Korean, and there are some allophonic changes. So if you know the letter, you don't always know how to say it, unless you know the rules. If you know the rules, you can read anything in Korean. Is Korean an alphabet or a syllabary? For those of you who know a little bit about Korean, if you don't, then you'll have to look it up. What would you say, Wendy? Okay. All right. How about the rest of you? Let's give this to you as a question. Look up Korean, the alphabet. Find out about it. I want you to tell me. Maybe I'll give it to you as a test question. I want you to decide. You now understand the difference between an. Alphabet and a syllabary. Is that right? Anybody have any questions? Is it not clear? So b e b. That's an example of Zhuyin Fu Hao behaving like an alphabet. B an ban b a n. Three phonemes because it's only two Fu Hao. In this case, it's behaving more like a syllabary, but not completely because 
Well, yeah, it's close enough, yeah. In that case, it's behaving like a syllabary. Japanese is a clear-cut example of a syllabary. How about Korean? Okay, write it down. I'll ask you on Wednesday. Do you think Korean should be classified as an alphabet or as a syllabary? And I'll write it down so I don't forget. Korean? Okay. Any questions before I move on? We're going to vowels now. Any questions? Okay. Anybody? Let's go. All right. So finally, you get your chance. Go ahead. Um, the transcription of vowels, the transcription of the contrasting vowels, the vowel phonemes in English. Contrasting it, vowels. Vowels, yeah, John. Contrasting vowels. The vowel phoneme, phonemes mm -hmm. in English is in, in English in, in English right. is more difficult than the transcription of consonants for two reasons. First, accents of English differ more in their use of vowels than in their use of consonants. Stop right there. Mark this. How do the accents of English vary? In what aspect do they vary the most? Vowels. Remember that that's not true of different accents of every language. I've talked to you before about Spanish. The double L in Spain is via, like Elia, Elia, ta. But in Latin America, it's mostly Elia, Elia, Elia. So in that case, the two varieties differ more in. Hmm? Spanish. This is Spanish we're talking about. Do they differ more in vowels or consonants based on the data so far? Consonants, the vowels are very, very close. There is not much variation among the different dialects or varieties of Spanish in vowels. But that's an example of how the consonants vary. Another example is the C and Z sounds. In spelling, words that are written with C or Z are pronounced with a th, a theta in Spain, like um, Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, cinco in Spain. Cinco, like in English, th. But it's cinco in Latin America. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco. Cinco, cinco. So that's another example of where they differ in consonants. But with English, it's the vowels. The vowels vary widely. They're changing, too. Vowels are changing in many parts of the English-speaking world. So that's one way. Well, one reason why what? It's harder to transcribe vowels in English because the, the dialects vary. We have to pick our dialect before we transcribe. And go. Second, authorities differ in their views. Differ. Of authorities. <laughs> What's authorities? It's the subject. Stop after the subject. Everybody remember that? Authorities differ. Right? So read again. Very good. You said appropriate, which is correct. A lot of people say appropriate, and that's a verb. To appropriate is a noun. Appropriate is a noun. All right, we made it through a paragraph. Those are both important because, first of all, uh, varieties of English differ greatly in the vowels, and different people have different ideas about how to represent the vowel sounds. Good. Go ahead. Taking the same approach. The same approach. The same approach. Same not jumping again. Taking the same approach. The same approach. The same approach in looking for contrasting vowels. Vowels. As, uh, uh, in looking for contrasting vowels, as we did for contrasting consonants. 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 We might try to find a minimal set of words. That differ only in a vowel. That what? Oh yeah, that's right. Sorry. That differ only in a vowel sound. Z. Sounds. Right. We could, for example, looking for, hmm? uh, look for monosyllables that begin with her and end with the, 
and supplement this minimal set with another list uh, with other list of monosyllables. Other lists uh, with other list. lists. List. Lists. Uh, with other lists. You did it. With mo uh, of monosyllables that contrast only contrast. That contrast Good. only in their vowel sounds. Good. Table two point two. Table, table, table two point two shows uh, five set of uh, five such sets of words. You should listen to the recordings of these words on the CD while reading the following discussion of the vowels. Okay, recordings. Recordings. Yeah. Okay. Stop there. Let's look at the table. And we're going to use the same method that we use with consonants, but this time we have two separate columns because what? We didn't need two separate columns before because we were talking about consonants and what? What about consonants? Are they so different between British and America, uh, British and American English? 差别不大,有,差别不是没有,有, but they're not important enough to bother with. However, when we come to vowels, then we have big problems, we have big differences. So the first column is American. If you look at the R's in there, then you know. The second column is Standard British, sometimes called RP. And like I say, there are not so many native speakers of Standard British anymore. A lot of people speak some kind of dialect that's different from the standard that you find in textbooks. 真正的讲的是很标准,很标准的那种RP。人数现在真的不多,越来越少,因为英语。英式英语在变,变得很快, as I've said before. So let's just look at the first column for American and we'll go back for British. And we're going to use H and D for the first column. The second column is HE. It's an open syllable. So what will we not find in the second column? What will, what will we not find in the second column? Short vowels. Very good, you got it now. And then in the third column, we've added a final D voiced, and then T, voiceless, final stop, and then we have keyed, kid, etc. We'll worry about the other ones later. So first of all, for American, everybody, E, e. heed, e. I. I, hid, A, A. haid. That's the way they say head in Singapore, by the way, haid. This is Xinjiang show told the fine. All right, E, head. Oh, it's hade. Yeah, I think it's hade. A, a. had, a. 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 Hard. hard. I do not like using an example with an R after it for any vowel because R changes the vowel in American. In British, hard is a good example for a, but it's not a good example for American because they always did that in our textbooks when I was in second grade, and I always felt you should not use an example with R because R changes the vowel. If it's a, uh, R is present through the whole vowel, like bird. They do it so they can compare British and American with the same word. But I don't think it's a good example. I would use the word spa or father. Spa, father, or spot. But um, here we have hard. Let's just change it to spa. Everybody, spa. There we go. The next one is hard. Now that's the problem. In American, they're both the same. Hard and hard. They're the same vowel. 很多用O拼成的字, so it is short O, is A in American. See the same symbol? All right, but they're different in British. We'll come back to it because it's confusing here. The next one, A, hard. Then we have U, hood. O, hold. U, Hood, a, uh, hud, that's a name, not hood. Open your mouth wider, hud. Yeah, that's better. And then we have er, heard. That is not a phoneme in American. We have a uh for British, hood. They put it in the list because it's a phoneme in British. They don't pronounce R's after vowels. In American, how many phonemes is it? Two, just like I'm. It's two phonemes. Er is two phonemes, but they do it because of the British. Next, I. I. And we would have hide here. Yeah, hide. hide. Ow. Ow. Howd. Howd. 
How do you do? How do you do in the test? That's a perfectly good word. It's a contraction. How, apostrophe, D. Howd. Everybody, howd. Oi. Oi. Hoid. Hoid. That is not a word. Let's use void. Everybody, void. Void. Uh-huh. And then we have er, or ear, I'm sorry, here. That is not a phoneme. It's two. Uh, then we have um, air, also not a phoneme, hair. hair. And ire, ire, also not a phoneme. But we'll go back to British and you'll see why it's there. And then you. Hued. You is not a phoneme. We count it as two sounds. It's a special diphthong. It's a rising diphthong. I told you about it before. Dig through your notes. Y is an onglide. It comes at the beginning of the diphthong. 它比较不显著的部分在前面那个叫onglide. 比较不显著的部分像i,在后面那个叫offglide. Remember? Not onglide, 我们只有u,没有别的. All right, 它有个比较特别的一个status. 它u,我们通常不当作是两个音,而不当作一个diphthong. <coughs> All right, for British, let's look at the same thing. E is almost the same. My British is not perfect. I'll give you something close. Because when people look at the video, they say, oh, what a terrible accent. So I'm just uh, making excuses first. All right, everybody, E. e. Heed. E. I. I. Hid. I. Now don't put the schwa in there. American, hid. Hid. In British, no schwa. Hid. Uh-huh. A. Hade. These are very similar. Not perfectly the same, but very similar. Eh. Head. Uh huh. Ah. In American, but in British, it's lower. Ha. Had. Ah. Had. It's lower, so it'll be D D N. And then, and probably more back. Ah. Hard. Hard. Make sure hard. You are the in hard. 然后呢，下一个是。有没有看到一个新鲜的一个符号? 它是没有帽子的A倒过来来写 That is a new symbol you're going to need And this is short, this one is short So you'll see that in the, second, in the next column, in the fourth column, there's no example um, It can occur in open syllables And this is, in American it's hod, in British it's hod Hod, don't make it too close because you'll mix it up with the next one Hod, hod, hod. All right. The next one is hod in American, and in British it would be hold. Hold. And my teacher says I do it pretty well now. Hold. All right. And that one is long or short? Long. Right. So keep those two separate. Hod is short. Hold is long. Open O is long in both dialects. And the dagolaida, A is short in British. We don't have it in American. But you need that symbol now. The next one, hood. In American, hood. Very clear diphthongal character. British, no diphthong. Hood. Yeah. Next one is, um, let's see, we're in. All right. Hold in American. In British, it's more of an O sound. And I overdo it usually. Hold. Hold. Yeah. So you see a schwa and an U. So O. In American, is usually schwa plus u in British. Hold, hold, hold. Okay? The next one is u, similar. U, hood. All right? The next one is quite different in British. In American, it's a, uh, cup, hud. In British, it sounds more like ah, uh, hud, ah. Uh. It's not ah, uh, like father. It's not ah, uh, it's ah, uh, ah, uh, hud, hud. Okay? That's why a lot of people get it wrong in English now. They're using a British influenced Dagolaida V. Dao V Handoran Da Shenzai, Tai Shin Yu Limen Yong the Sin So In Su In Shanga Iga Asa. A cup. It should be cup in American, but it's cup in British, a cup of tea. Alright? Next one, we don't have an American except with er. In American it's heard, in British it's er. Uh, heard. Hood. Good. The next one is this almost the same. I. Hide. 
啊，再来一次 hide. Okay, the next one, ow, is very similar. And we don't have an example, but howled, howled. Yeah, we do. We have howled. Similar. Oi is very similar. I think my British friend says oi the all part longer than I do. I say, for example,、um, void, and he might say void. He might make it longer. Okay, so it's very short in American. Void, void. Okay. Then we have、um, ear. In American, it's ear. Everyone, ear. Here. 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 British here. 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 Now, is that one or two syllables? Here. They count it as one syllable because a diphthong means it occurs in the same syllable. But if you say it slow, it sounds like two syllables. Here, come here, here. To me, my ears say two syllables. And besides, I believe there's an R there. That's all the more reason I want to hear another sound. And I will tell you something that's funny with Americans when we're listening to British. We often hear R's when they're not there. Woman, 因为习惯 R 会被一个刷来代替，我们就当做好像真的有听到 R 一样。That's happened before, and I'll say, "Well, I heard an R in his British," and my friend says, "No way, no, impossible." But I hear R's. Well, I'm not so much now, but for a while I did. What were you able to hear? What R? Because I automatically, my brain puts R's in there, and you may do the same too because you're used to American English, most of you. The next one is hair in American, in British, hair, hair, hair. hair. Okay, and then we have hired. This one's problematic because it. Can be a sanmu in. It can be hired, hire, hire. Can you hear three vowels? In British, it can be three vowels. Hire. Try hire, hire. But you can also say hire. He wants to hire someone. Hire, hire, hire. 他可以省略变成一个 diphthong. Everybody, hire, hire. Uh huh. Okay, and you is about the same. Hued, hued. hued. I think they have more friction. British vowels, I'm sorry, British consonants, in my experience, tend to be more affricated. They have more friction. 就是英式的子音，它那个摩擦的程度比美式大。Okay, they they're not always affricated, but I often hear more friction, more force in the consonants than I do in American. And The other columns you can look at yourself.、Uh, let's just go over what they are for, what they are there for.、Um, in the next paragraph, he says that first of all, we're looking at only one form of British and one form of American. So not all Americans speak like this, and not all Brits speak like that. It's just two representative kinds of English: one American, one British. And we don't pronounce R's after vowels in English because、uh, in, Amer- in British English because British English is not a what kind of dialect? Rhotic, yeah. Let's stick with the O sound. Rhotic. British English is a non-rhotic variety. Not all British English. In many parts of England, they do have R's, but not in Standard British. So British English is a non-rhotic dialect. My dialect is a. Rhotic. I speak a rhotic dialect, dialect of English, and because of the dropped R's, they did used to have R's. That's why they're in the spelling. And early on in English, R's used to be trilled. R. 最早的时候，古英文的 R 是 R. R 是后来的一个发音变化 All right. And then the the dropping of the R's is fairly recent in British English. 这是几百年而已的事情。那个母音后的 R 不发音，那是几百最近几百年的事情，本来有。And because of the dropped R's, we have a bunch of extra diphthongs. Pick out very quickly the diphthongs we have because of dropped R's in British English. Go through the list quickly, grab them. In column two, they are. Which ones? Ear, as in here, and air, as in hair, and ah, as in ha. All right, those are three extra diphthongs we have because of dropped vowels in British English, and we also have the extra sound uh as uh as in heard, heard. And that's not a diphthong, but it's a 
sound we don't have in American. Everybody found it? All right. And? OK. So we have extra diphthongs in British. And they're talking about some var uh, variations in American English, such as odd, odd, caught, caught. Wes, uh, sorry, um, Stanley has been posting some questions about this on NTU Phonetics on Facebook. So you can go back to those posts. And also on our website, I want you to read some web pages. Go to pages 25 and 26. Please read pages 25 and 26. Those are the two pages that discuss the ah, ah merger in American English. And as I've mentioned before, about what percent of Americans merge these two sounds? Ah and ah. For example, tat, taught, cat, caught. 美国的大概百分之多少把这两个音合并了? Easy to remember, just guess. It's about half. 大约是百分之五十的人, ag and ah 已经合并了. You'll need to know this. OK? 大概有一半的美国人, ag and ah 是一个音. 都念作 ah也可以, 都念作 ah也可以. 可是合并了, 是同一个音, 不, 不区别, about half of Americans. Um, and some speakers, mainly from the East, distinguish between can from the noun can. So I can do it. Because can. Can. I met uh, the first paragraph on page 40. Everybody got that? So can is just can. Can. I've heard that. Um, so the first column in Table 2.2 is American. The second column is Standard British. And then he tried to line them up as best as he could. And then, let's see. How did we pick the vowel symbols for the IPA? We used continental European values. If we just pick a language from West Europe, like French, Spanish, or Italian, how does spelling? 就是用到那个母音的那个写法跟发音，我们就是用那个东西做IPA的符号。So, for example, if you see an A in Italian or in Spanish, it will usually be ah. In American, it's usually ah, but in these languages, it's usually ah. So that's why we picked the symbols we did for the vowel symbols in IPA. Okay? 就是根据西欧最就多数的语言的用法，它的拼拼法跟发音的用法。and it's also pretty much applicable to languages like Swahili, Turkish, and Navajo as well. So we will use the same symbols of the IPA when we're writing a spelling alphabet, when we're creating a spelling alphabet for new languages, like the three I just mentioned. Turkish used to be written in what kind of an alphabet? Alexander's not in class this year. Alexander's crazy about Turkish, right? Zhang Shichuan. OK? So Turkish is now written in the Latin alphabet with some extra symbols, some diacritics. It used to be written in what? Turkish used to be written in what kind of alphabet? Just guess. Think of their religion. Arabic. Arabic, not aerobic, by the way. <laughs> OK, everybody, Arabic. It's written in the Arabic alphabet, like many Languages that um, have a largely Muslim population, many of them adopted an Arabic alphabet, um, but they changed with the, with the Turkish Revolution. Uh, they changed to Romanization. And there's another place in China that uses the Arabic alphabet. Where? Xinjiang. They also used Romanization for a while. For a while, they used the Latin alphabet, and then they changed back to the Arabic alphabet. So if you go to Xinjiang, you will see signs all over in the Arabic alphabet for Uyghur, which is related to Turkish, by the way. OK. And we did not realize our dream. <laughs> OK.
All right, so we're going to start with the second to the last paragraph of 40. Please read ahead. Read ahead. Read the web pages I just gave you. Read ahead in the text so that we can get through it fast. They're mostly things that we already know. We just need to sort of solidify them. And then get ready for the next test, which will be in another week or two. Okay? So please preview the text. Let's get through it next time. And then we'll see you on Wednesday.